Welcome to Lesson 8D, Induced Drag, Momentum, and Downwash. In this lesson, we'll analyze induced drag based on linear momentum control volume analysis. We'll be able to generate an equation for induced drag. Then we'll analyze induced drag qualitatively based on downwash and effective angle of attack. Let's look at this momentum analysis qualitatively first. The basic concept is that pressure downstream is less than pressure upstream due to the trailing vortices. In other words, as the air is spinning around these vortices, we generate low pressure zones in the air surrounding these vortices. The overall pressure here downstream of the wing is thus lower than pressure upstream of the wing, hence a drag. Now let's do a quantitative analysis. As a quick review, in the previous lesson we used kinetic energy with a similar looking control volume. We got di, the induced drag, is one half rho times integral over the area A, the area of this downstream face, of V squared plus W squared dA, where we're talking about the YZ plane. This face is perpendicular to X. In this lesson, we'll use linear momentum to try to come up with another equation for induced drag. Our control volume is again a box around the wing, but this control volume is moving with the wing so we have flow coming in the left face and flow going out the right face. So unlike the previous lesson, this problem is steady. If it helps you visualize it better, think of this wing in a wind tunnel, the wing being stationary, and we're watching flow come in from the left and go out the right past the wing. That's the same as this control volume moving with the wing if this were an actual flying wing. But now the problem is steady. I show the lift and the induced drag acting on the wing and the control volume is the air. In other words, we're not including the wing. This induced drag di is shown as the induced drag acting on the wing. Same with the lift force. The force acting on the air will be equal and opposite here acting to the left. This is what we'll use in our control volume since our control volume consists of just the air. This is thus the induced drag of the wing acting on the air. Let's call the area on the left side of this control volume AL and on the right side AR. On this left area where the flow comes in, the flow is uniform free stream. On the right face, we have the same U, but we also have swirling air in the YZ plane and in the Y and Z components due to the vortices. Since this is a rectangle, the right area and left area are equal. So we'll apply linear momentum analysis on this steady fixed control volume. Let's use the integral control volume equation for linear momentum that we derived in a previous lesson and we'll apply this in the x or the x1 direction. I'll draw a small version of this control volume for reference and recall that we have induced drag acting to the left in the negative x direction since it's the force of the wing acting on the air in the control volume. We also have our trailing vortices, of course. We can write this equation as the integral over the control volume, del del t, rho u1 d volume, plus integral over the control surface, and this will be the entire control surface, rho ui uj daj, equal integral over the control volume of rho g1 d volume, and we're doing this in the x direction only, so this should be a u1, and we're using the one component or x component of gravity as well, plus integral over the entire control surface of t1j daj. Well, two of these terms drop off immediately, since in this reference frame the flow is steady, and vector g has no component in the x direction. This equation is in the x1 or x direction. Let's examine the two remaining terms. If we take a small element of area, DAL, on the left face, its components are negative 1, 0, 0, DA. And similarly, on the right side, its components are 1, 0, 0, DA. Since index J is repeated, we sum. We have U1, U1, DAL1 on the left face, plus U1, U2, DAL2, plus U1, U3, DAL3. But you can see that DAL2 and 3 are 0. The only component is in the x1 direction, so those two terms go away. On the left side, DAL1 is negative 1, 
as we see here, times dA, and U1 is simply equal to capital U. So this term on the left face, when we integrate over the whole area, AL, we get negative rho, capital U squared, and the integration just gives us the actual area, AL. On the right face, we get the same thing, except positive, and area AR, which is equal to area AL, because the only thing that changes is this negative sign. And we're assuming that the speed in the x direction is capital U everywhere on this face. There's an additional swirl component, but it doesn't affect the x1 component of velocity. These two cancel each other out, since the two areas are equal, so this whole term is also zero. All we're left with then is this term. This includes all the surface forces acting on the right and the left surfaces. Since everything's symmetric, the top and bottom and left and right surfaces do not contribute anything in the x direction. Let's expand this term out. Since it's the only term left in the equation, zero equal the sum of all the forces, which is negative di, the induced drag acting on the air by the wing, we can think of that as our sigma f other plus sigma fx viscous plus sigma fx pressure. Well, viscous effects are insignificant since this is an irritational flow, but this term is not zero. To get the total pressure force, we would integrate over the left face, PL dA, minus integral over the right face of PR dA, where this negative sign is because pressure acts to the left or negative x direction on the right surface, and pressure acts positively on the left surface. Thus we have di equal the integral over area A on the right side of PL minus PR dA as our equation for induced drag, where we have combined these two terms into one integral since the areas themselves are equal and we'll take our element of area directly across from each other. So if we can find this pressure difference, we can calculate the induced drag. So here's a question for the students. How do we get the pressure field? Well, since the flow is incompressible and irritational, can we use beloved Bernoulli? Yes, we can, Dud. Golly, it's not often I get the right answer. Well, you did this time. Well, as Dud said, the answer is that we can use the beloved Bernoulli equation since we're dealing with steady, incompressible, and irrotational flow. Well, the beloved Bernoulli equation, as discussed in a previous lesson, is P plus one-half rho magnitude of velocity squared plus rho gz equal a constant, and since it's irrotational flow, it's the same constant everywhere. Well, since the two areas are at the same elevation and there's no gravity in the x direction, the gravity term goes away. So we write this as PL plus one half rho VL squared equal PR plus one half rho VR squared, where L and R refer to the left and right faces respectively. So if we can find or measure VL and VR, which we'll write as the difference, PL minus PR equal one half rho VR squared minus VL squared. The left face is trivial since the speed is constant everywhere on the left face and equal to free stream value U. So VL squared is U squared. What about VR? Well, at our right face, we have our speed U in the X direction, but at some point on this face, we would also have a component due to the swirl around the vortex. This additional component of velocity is in the y and z directions and will change as we move along the surface. For example, somewhere here, the extra component would be going up, whereas here it's going down as sketched. The vector sum of these would point like this, the magnitude of which is what we'll call vr. So vr squared is equal to u squared plus v squared plus w squared, or u2 squared plus u3 squared if you want to stay in tensor notation. Thus our equation for the pressure difference, when we plug in vr squared and vl squared, we get pl minus pr equal one half rho u squared plus v squared plus w squared minus u squared, and the u squareds cancel leaving us with only the v squared plus w squared terms. This is the equation for the pressure difference between any two matching points, for example, this point and this point, on opposite faces of the control volume, the left face and the right face. If we go back to our equation for induced drag, 
we had di equal the integral over the area, pl minus pr da. Therefore, plugging in this for pl minus pr, we get di equal 1 half rho integral over area a, b squared plus w squared da. Thus, we get an equation for induced drag. And what's nice is that this is the same as we got from our kinetic energy analysis. We derive this using linear momentum, but we get the same answer as with kinetic energy, which I think is very cool and makes me happy. Finally, let's consider the downwash argument. I typed out the basic concept that the trailing vortices induce a downwash that makes the wing feel an effective free stream that is angled somewhat downward. It's no longer parallel to the x-axis. This is the downwash argument because at some line segment cutting through these trailing vortices, the velocity field looks something like what I'm sketching. It's a function of y, this dimension, and we'll call this component wd, which is the downwash speed. It's not uniform, but at every location between these two vortices, it's downward and defined as positive downward. I'm going to talk about this only qualitatively, so we'll look at the effect of this downwash on the wing. It turns out that if we take some slice through this wing, where it has some appropriate WD, and this is the X direction, the free stream is capital U on both ends, but the downwash ends up looking something like this, where we'll call this WD at the airfoil, and it ends up being half of the downwash far downstream. Qualitatively, this airfoil is experiencing a downwash. In other words, the flow is not only going in the x direction, but also downward. And the downwash is a much smaller vector than capital U. So because of this downwash, the airfoil experiences or feels an effectively smaller angle of attack. Let me sketch this more clearly. This is our airfoil with speed u coming from the left. The actual angle of attack is alpha, but because of the downwash, the effective velocity hitting the airfoil is angled somewhat downward. We'll call this angle epsilon, where ue is the effective upstream velocity, what the airfoil actually feels, and thus the effective angle of attack is reduced by angle epsilon. We'll let alpha e be the effective angle of attack. In terms of the lift and drag, the actual lift is perpendicular to U, but the effective lift, which we'll call LE, which is actually felt by the airfoil, is tilted, again, at angle epsilon, because by definition of lift, lift is always defined as perpendicular to the incoming free stream, while here the effective lift is perpendicular to the effective incoming free stream. In terms of magnitudes, since UE is larger than U, as you can see in this triangle, LE would tend to be bigger than L. But since the effective angle of attack is smaller, LE would tend to be smaller than L. So we'd have to do some more detailed analysis to figure out exactly what LE is. For the sake of argument, I'll just draw it at this magnitude. Compared to L, there's an additional component parallel to U, and that will be the induced drag. DI is parallel to U by definition. Thus, we have another explanation for induced drag. Again, this is just qualitative, but it turns out that lift coefficient increases like angle of attack alpha, in other words, it's linear, but induced drag coefficient increases like alpha squared, where we define CDI as induced drag over 1 half rho U squared A. This A, by the way, is not the same as that of the face in our control volume. This is the planform area of the wing. This angle epsilon, by the way, increases as alpha increases. Finally, if we sketch CL and CDI as functions of alpha angle of attack, for a non-cambered wing, CL grows like alpha until it hits stall, where the flow separates. But CDI grows parabolically until stall. The induced drag is zero when the lift is zero. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.